God's love is infinite, full of tenderness, full of mercy, full of forgiveness, full of uh, kindness, full of thoughtfulness. Doesn't matter color, doesn't matter race, doesn't matter nationality, doesn't matter religion. Hindu, Muslim, Jews, Buddhist, communist, Christian. Every single man, woman, child is the child of God, created in the image of God. It is one thing to theoretically know that God exists in every person and quite another to actually bend down to lift a person in acute distress from the streets and nurse him or her with tender motherly care. Such a blending of words and deeds is a rare occurrence in our lifetime. In mother's case, this went on for more than 50 years, day after day. This act has moved millions and they've been inspired by her personal example to do at least one act of compassion. Preparation with Mother Teresa had for this work was her background in Albania. Albania was a multi-religious and ethnic society where you had people of different uh, communities, different religions, living in peace and harmony in Albania. And so when she came to Calcutta and she saw these same people, it was no problem for her to respond to them in their diversities. It was her vision of people as a human person. And in every human person, she saw the face of Christ. At 17 and 18, young people don't know what they're going to do. She had decided that she was going to leave her home, her beloved mother, her family. She was going to come to India. She knew in those days missionaries never went back. A girl of 18 realizes she's not going to go back again and see her mother. And she never did meet her mother again. She comes to faraway India, where is Bengal, where is Skopje, you know, these are two worlds that weren't meeting at that time. She didn't know any English, she certainly didn't know any Indian language, she joins the Loreto order, she learns English there in Ireland, she comes to India, she's one of the first girls to learn Bengali, she speaks it fluently, she starts an order. She steps out alone onto the streets. No companion, no helper, no money to speak of. Can you imagine somebody like this in the streets of Calcutta in 1946? A European, yet not a European, wearing a sari that the municipal sweepresses wear, but that became her holy garment, bought for one rupee by Father Van Exim. She bought three sarees, rough sandals, walking the streets in Calcutta, trying to start something, teaching herself to beg. Her whole life, as I look on it, was a miracle. A dying young man, young boy of maybe 15, 16, dying. She put on my lap. I said, if the boys who want to marry me or my father will see me in this condition, what a condition. I was so frightened. I hold it. She said, this is Jesus. This is Jesus dying. Don't hold him. Don't let him fall down. 
Old woman lying in the street and she was dying. So one sister went to pick her up and the old lady said, you can't touch me. Only if you are a Brahmin, you can touch me. I don't want to be touched by any other person of any other caste. So mother goes to her and she says, come, we'll take you home. We'll look after you. She says, no, are you a Brahmin? So mother says, I thought to myself, and I said, who is a Brahmin? Brahmin is somebody who serves his people. I said, yes, I am a Brahmin. So such was the vision of mother and a compassion that she, she went beyond religion. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Agnes Gonja Boyaju was born on 26th August 1910 in Skopje, Macedonia. At the time, Skopje was a small town in the Kingdom of Albania, a part of the Ottoman Empire. Albania was at the crossroads of divergent cultural and religious forces. At the age of 18, moved by a desire to become a missionary, Gonja left her home in September 1928 to join the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary known as the Sisters of Loreto in Ireland. After two months at the Loreto Abbey in Rathfarnaham, Dublin, where she learnt English, Teresa set sail for India, arriving in Calcutta on 6 January 1929. A few days later, she was sent to the Loreto Novitiate in Darjeeling. It was here, below the snow-clad mountain Kanchanjunga, that she began her life as a novice, praying, studying, training for her life as a religious sister. After taking her first vows of poverty, chastity and obedience as a sister of Loreto on May 24, 1931, Sister Teresa, as she was now called, was assigned to teach at St. Mary's School, a part of the Loreto convent in Entali, Calcutta. She remained here for 17 happy years, first as a teacher of geography, history and catechism, and later as the principal of the school. These were years of deep spiritual formation, as her life of prayer and her closeness to God shaped her. Sister Teresa took her final vows on 24th May 1937. From then on, she was known as Mother Teresa. The sisters' lives were soon disrupted. With Japan's entry into the Second World War and the occupation of neighboring Burma, Calcutta became the operational center. Scores of buildings were requisitioned by the military 
and had to be evacuated. Close on the heels of the war came the Great Bengal Famine of 1942-43. Burmese rice was cut off because of the Japanese invasion. Prices rose. Peasants were forced to sell their land and in a final bid to avoid starvation flocked to Calcutta. Hundreds of thousands thronged the city where they had no place to live except on the pavements. On 16th August 1946, a mass meeting was called by the Muslim League in Calcutta Maidan. Roused passions sparked bloody riots between Hindus and Muslims. For the first time, Mother Teresa was faced with the prospect of 200 starving children on her hands. With independence came partition and the largest human migration in history. Mother, 1946, 10th of January, not an entire convent, that the whole thing taken by British Army as a military quarters. And the boarding school part where the girls will go to stay. They given a factory order, 14 convent road. There we were there as boarders. Few nuns of other congregation and mother alone with one old nun. Suddenly we heard World War stopped and um, mother has to, um, we can transfer. So we went back to Lorikri in Delhi, one by one convent for them. And there we have, mother has, what struggle mother had to get. One day we have no food. So mother says, children go to pray, I am going to beg. So she went out and the British army saw her. Mother, where are you going? We cut you. I, my children has no food. She told her, you go and pray and any vegetable you find, boil and cook, I will come. So she came back with the military, brought her few trucks of rice with her and brought back mother. She did once say that when she used to teach in the Loreto convent and she used to overlook the slums, uh, she would feel that her life was so secure and in many ways not comfortable in any grand way but certainly secure and she would look at the poor. And then she also saw the poor multiplying because of these very reasons, that terrible famine where four million people at least have, have died, whatever the official estimates may be. And then the great tragedy of partition. The pavements of Calcutta, there was no place to stand. And it is into that that she finally, that call came to her. And she believed it always to be a real call, that what are you doing here? You have to serve me amongst the poor and be on the streets. September, she said, now puja holiday coming, I am going for retreat. I said, I cannot cross again across the Ganges. You know, how will you do? They not allow me to come. You know, Amadha Deshiki. Then, I, she said, you stay here, look after the orphans. So I said, I will help with the orphans, I stay here. So 9th of September, I put her in the train. On 10 September 1946, while on the train to Darjeeling for her retreat, Mother Teresa experienced Jesus speaking to her. It was an inner command. She said to renounce Loreto, where she was very happy, to go to serve the poor in the streets. The call continued in Darjeeling throughout the retreat. The message was quite clear, she explained. It was an order. I was to leave the convent. I felt that God wanted more from me. He wanted me to be poor and to love him in the distressing disguise of the poorest of the poor.
she said this that you know when Christ was suffering I wasn't there to serve him when he was crucified and all that she says so everyone who's suffering is my Christ it's a you can't have a better concept and vision about mankind that every suffering man is a Christ for her can't replace it with anything else and the closer she went the enormity of it was so large that India being such a huge country and a poor country that she was faced with so many problems and it was a gigantic task and it was also becoming impossible so she said that she mm, uh, two things are very precious to her a to have compassion and do seva and look after the poorest of the poor and b after doing that she has to connect with the lord to rejuvenate herself for the next day Coming back, she said, that Jesus wants somebody for the poor. Look at the amount of poor, and it happened. I had to go out with mother on the way we saw. You saw these children, they're picking up a dustbin. They have no education. They beg. What will happen to their future? Who will go to them? All the senior girls told us that mother is going, we are going to give her farewell. And we sang for her one farewell song. Jodi to dark shune keo naashe, tabe akla chalore. In August 1948, Mother Teresa exchanged her black Loretto habit for a white cotton sari with a blue border and left the Loreto convent. The Bengali Teresa started on her way. Leaving Loreto was the most difficult thing she had ever done, a greater sacrifice than leaving her family and country to enter religious life. This was the first time that the very stratified Catholic Church at the Vatican gave permission to a single nun to remain with her vows intact in that she remained a nun and they gave her permission to step out on the streets of Calcutta, a permission that they had denied Mary Ward 300 years before. So this was the first time in the history of the Catholic Church that they allowed at the level of the Vatican a single nun to step out into the streets. There had to be something. When Mother Teresa first entered the slum at Mutijheel, the poverty and suffering she saw was dreadful. There was no clinic or dispensary. She cleaned and bandaged wounds and gave medicine to those she could. On the very first day, she met parents who were delighted at the prospect of having a school in their midst. And on the second day, five little children were waiting for her. As soon as mother comes, ma, 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 everybody coming around. Dirty children, and they are coming around me, and I am moving and right. <laughs> but don't do that. This is little Jesus. Little Jesus, you have to clean them like Mary. So mother gave me some rag to wipe their face, and she made me to go and give them bath and wipe them, clean their nose and to comb their hair. And then she will teach them singing. Mother already taught them Bengali songs. She knew Bengali and Tagore songs. Little children were dancing in a circle. After they sit down on the ground, they are reading and writing means in poetry, like one, two, three, then oh, ah, oh, oh. This was how they started. But within a fortnight, with the help of volunteers, Mother Teresa had opened both a school and a dispensary at Motiji. She called the school Nirmal Hridaya. The little school in the shadow of the Loreto convent had become a reality. She opened a second school at Tiljola. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. 
As the work increased, she needed to be closer to the Motijil slum, and Mother Teresa moved into an empty room on the top floor of the Gomez's family residence in Creek Lane. But on the day she actually moved into Creek Lane, she was overcome by loneliness. For the first time, she was entirely on her own. And I arrived to put in Creek Lane. You know, I'm waiting for mother. They told mother is putting sari, the children of that house, and she is gone to the poor people to work. And Agnes also, Subhashini joined, she also gone to school to study, because she was finishing her study. So I waited and waited. About one o'clock, mother is coming alone with one lady at the corner of the creek lane. You know, not the same, same person, but you know, I cannot explain to you my that elegant uh, European dress and a nun in that simple poor sari of the people who clean the street without shoes, sandal, and so tired with a rosary in her hand, praying and bag. And she climbed, she climbed on the third floor of the kitchen. And she came in, it was in the year 1949. She entered number 14 Creek Lane and she was climbing up the stairs and she told us not to come upstairs. When I was a young fellow, like 12 years of age. And then gradually the, the congregation started increasing in numbers. There were a lot of girls joining the congregation. And after three or four years, there were about 27 nuns in this house. Three weeks after Mother Teresa moved into Creek Lane, she was joined by her first postulant, Subhashini Das, the future Sister Agnes. A short while later, another former student from St. Mary's Magdalena Paulton appeared outside the door. She became the second postulant and took the name of Sister Gertrude. It was a, three of us. Then again, come fourth one comes on May. Then comes somebody, September comes one. So that year only four of us and mother, five of us. Next year comes one by one, you saw the photo. Then we asked mother, mother, where do you, do you live? She told us, you come and see. And she gave us address, 14 number Creek Lane. When I saw some girls or parts, St. Mary's, in Delhi, they joined. Then I was thinking, I also will join. And then that time already, we are 24 of us. From there, mothers to spread us where, where to go, two by two. Mother taught her sisters to remain cheerful. Peals of laughter filled their homes. God loves a cheerful giver, she used to say. Her work was serious, but joyfulness was an important prerequisite for entry into her mission. The young women dressed in distinctive white saris with blue bands were soon a familiar sight in the poor areas they served. Missionaries of charity must go out onto the streets. You have seen, she said, how difficult it is for them to come to us. We must go to them. We had a lot to learn from the poor, she said. The poor give us much more than we give them. They're such strong people, living day to day with no food, and they never curse, never complain. We don't have to give them pity or sympathy. We have so much to learn from them. It is not how much we do, but how much love we put in the giving.
Nirmal Hridaya, the home of the pure heart, is a free hospice for the sick, destitute and the dying in Kaligad. While walking around Calcutta, mother and sisters came across cores of malnourished people living on the streets. Tuberculosis was rife and overcrowded hospitals could do little for them in their advanced stage of illness. There was nowhere to take them, so they died on the street. The first woman that I saw, I picked up from the street. She had been half eaten by the rats. And, um, and I took her myself to the hospital. And they, as they could not do anything, they accepted her because I refused to move from there until they took her in. From there, I went to the municipality and I asked them just to give me a place where I could bring these people because on the same day, I found more people dying in the street. Undeterred, Mother Teresa went to the Calcutta municipality for help and she was given use of one of the shelters for pilgrims adjoining the Kali temple. On 22nd August 1952, two years after she established the Missionaries of Charity, Mother Teresa opened the first home for the dying in Kaligad and named it Nirmal Hridaya. People who were brought here received medical attention and here they could die with dignity and in peace according to the rituals of their faith. And as she worked over there slowly, she managed to obtain the permission to start her Nirmal Ridai, which was, I would say, a very special gift of God. Somehow the humanity of people, both in the Kali temple and humanity of people in the distressing situation in which they found themselves in what was, became, came to be known as Nirmal Rudai, began to touch the hearts of all. The only thing you only came to know about mother, 52, when she went to Kalika to open, I went to clean with mother and all. Then I saw a newspaper cutting about this is about the new, Desmond Roy. He put the first one who put mother in the this is in Kali Temple, no? That is the new one that she opened. So this is the newspaper by Desmond Doig. Desmond Doig, one of our editors from the Statesman, who watched Mother for, a, uh, for some time, and then he wanted me to come to Calcutta to photograph her. He says, I met a great lady, Raghuraya, you've got to meet her. So I went there, I was also equally flown. I said, wow. I was photographing her, you know, nursing these old women and things like that and then one sister comes and she says sister uh, mother there is a Swiss banker who wants to see you and he's come all the way you know from wherever so she said okay let me finish this then I'll meet him so after a few minutes when she finished nursing this woman she goes to him and they shake hands and he starts talking that you know, he comes from this place and he has a lot of money that he like to be associated with mother's work. But the, the language and the feeling that he was using was a bit of arrogance and uh, that I can do this. So mother looked at him and she says, you know, in your country also there are many old people who need to be looked after. You know, in my own country, my people give me enough money for my poor people. So why don't you do something in your own country? She sent him back. She made me proud. She did me proud. I felt a great Indian. On 14 December 1951, Mother Teresa received Indian citizenship. She said, by blood, I'm an Albanian. By citizenship, an Indian. By faith, I'm a Catholic nun. As to my calling, I belong to the world. As to my heart, I belong entirely to the heart of Jesus.
Over the next two years, almost 30 young women joined the order. They now needed a larger place. The church advanced Mother Teresa an interest-free loan to purchase a property. And in February 1953, the missionaries of Charity Sisters moved into 54A Lower Circular Road. It became the headquarters of the missionaries of Charity and was henceforth called Mother House. In the silence of the heart, God speaks. If you face God in prayer and silence, God will speak to you. Then you will know you are nothing. It is only when you realize your nothingness, your emptiness, that God can fill you with Himself. I was photographing her for three, four days and then the, the, the fourth day she tells me, Raghura, you don't come tomorrow. I said, why mother? She says, tomorrow is Easter day. And on Easter days we'll be doing our prayers. And I don't want anybody, and especially a photographer, to be running around and, you know, disturbing the peace. So I said, mother, you say that for you, doing seva is the first most important thing in your life. And also you say, you do it because you think all those people who are suffering are your Christ. She says, yes. Second, very equally important part is that you say that after doing seva, I need to connect with the Lord to get rejuvenated for the next day. I said, I don't know who that guy is. I have never seen him. But I know this for sure. When you sit in prayer, he comes and resides in your eyes. And if I can't photograph you, that become incomplete story. The best thing about mother was that if you made that direct connection with honesty and commitment, she'll say, all right, come tomorrow at six o'clock. But with one condition, that you will stay at one place and not move around. And after about half an hour of prayers and everything, you know, of course, I took pictures of the sisters and the priests sitting there. After that, you know, when the prayers came to an end, all the sisters were going to the priest and they were kissing the feet of the Christ and moving out. Now then comes mother's turn to get up. So finally, I also get up. I follow her very slowly. I take my pictures. Mother touches the feet of the Christ. She, like other sisters, she comes out from the other door. And now, it was a moment of to face the mother for breaking the promise, the commitment that I had made. So I went to mother with my folded hands. I said, mother, please forgive me. I couldn't keep my promise. So she held both my hands. She says, oh, God has given you this assignment. You must do it well. What she believed in and taught about the fundamentals of human life are particularly relevant in our times. Given her interaction with people of diverse cultures and backgrounds, no life situation was foreign to her. She communicated her convictions as to where true peace and happiness are to be found, inspiring by her sincerity of words and the authenticity of her life. Her example of love and her words of wisdom will help us to bring more love into our world and make it a better place to live in. The Shishu Bhavans or children's homes established all over India have become the symbol of Mother Teresa's work. They provide care to the orphaned and sick children. Every Shishu Bhavan is colorful, full of light and cheerful children at play. Mother Teresa has certainly been an important influence in breaking the prejudices surrounding adoption that exist in India. 
But although adoption remains an important activity of these centers, many of them provide continuous care and a permanent home for hundreds of mentally retarded and severely handicapped children. I was very young when I started working for the Missionaries of Charity. Um, I must have been, um, I think, 20. And uh, there was a group of ladies who uh, were working together. And uh, they would meet once a, a week to make paper packets for the lepers. And uh, Mother had actually taught us how to make those packets because then they'd be very easy for the lepers to take out their medicine, etc. After that, I got involved gradually with uh, a lot of her work, in the sense that uh, if I went to Shishu Bhavan, uh, you know, she'd ask me to work there for, say, six months, and the work would be different, or, for every day. It wasn't the same thing. So you never got bored. And uh, her whole way of involving you was uh, very interesting and uh, actually cheerful. I cannot give the love a real mother can give, but I have never refused a child. Never. Not one. Each child is precious. Each child is created by God. So I must tell you about uh, Mr. Jyoti Basu, because when I interviewed him for my book, I said, uh, uh, what can you, an atheist and a communist, possibly have in common with Mother Teresa for whom God is everything? And he laughed and he said, we both share a love for the poor. And that summed it up. From the time she started her work on the streets of Calcutta, when the legendary Dr. B.C. Roy's family members joined her on the streets, she never discriminated between this religion or that faith. For her, the person whom she was looking after, the child abandoned on the street, the handicapped child, the man dying on the street, not just in our streets, but streets all over the world. This, the patient suffering from AIDS, a patient suffering from leprosy. For her, this was all the manifestation of either the dying Christ, so this was her God, or the abandoned Christ, or the suffering Christ. So she saw everybody from the prism of her religion, but she didn't discriminate. We often prayed with her. And we used to, before any special occasion or before a trip or whatever, different reasons, we would go and ask her to pray for us and to pray with us. So uh, she would take us to her chapel. And uh, I mean, so clearly she would say that, you know, you don't have to kneel. You don't have to do what we have to do. You can sit the way you sit cross-legged when you say your prayers. And uh, you say your prayers and I'll say mine. So, you know, and I will pray for you. And then after we said our prayers, um, when she would say a prayer f with us, for us, uh, she would say it loudly in her way. And uh, I mean, it was amazing. You know, I mean, what a treat for us. And the work never stops as more institutions were set up. The inmates at Premdan suffer mostly from malnutrition, tuberculosis, various kinds of physical handicaps and mental problems. A doctor visits here regularly. Like all Mother Teresa's centers, Premdan is clean and enveloped with an air of calm. 
I worked with her for 36 years, actually working with her and doing work in her administrative work. And, uh, you know, she asked me to type out all her receipts and she had put out a typewriter. I mean, you couldn't have found an older typewriter. <laughs> and she put it in that little passage upstairs and put a stool and told me, okay, now you can work from here. So I was doing all this work and I said, my God, am I going to do this every day? And, uh, but I did. And it didn't bother me. I mean, there was no feeling that can I have a backrest or somehow you ad adapted to her style. Shantidan is a home for mentally and physically disabled girls and young women. These girls are divided into groups based on their abilities. Flowers, birds, angels, butterflies, stars and rainbows. Dayadan is an orphanage for handicapped adolescent males. All of them are mentally handicapped and many have physical handicaps as well. Mother Teresa identified with the sufferings of the poor, experiencing in the depths of her soul their struggle and pain. With her extraordinary faith in God and surrender to His will, she embraced these intense sufferings with heroic courage. The Gandhiji Prem Nivas Leprosy Center, which stretches across a narrow 10-kilometer strip along the Titagore Khorda railway line, is a testimony to Mother Teresa's determination. She was drawn to the plight of the leprosy afflicted because of the social stigma attached to leprosy. Although the disease is easily treated, battling the stigma was an uphill task. Prem Nivas is a monument of courage and was one of the first of 16 centers in India. Prem Nivas began as a small mobile clinic under a tree in the midst of a crime-ridden community of leopards. Ostracized to the very edge of town near a snake-infested swamp. There was no drainage, no drinking water, no sewage, no electricity not even a proper roof over their heads. The Titagore municipality donated the land and the rehabilitation center bears a small sign acknowledging the efforts of the patients in the construction of the building. Mother Teresa handed over this arduous task to the missionaries of Charity Brothers. Here, leprosy patients weave the white saris with blue borders worn by the sisters of the missionaries of charity. They also weave the sheets, bedspreads and cloth used in various centers. There is a center making artificial limbs and crutches and a tailoring section where rubber and plastic sheets are stitched, all for in-house use. 
workers are paid a daily wage and also provided with food, clothing, housing and medical care. There was a knock on my door and there was Mother Teresa. So I said, Mother, why didn't you tell me I would have come there? No, 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 no. Uh, we have a problem and I wanted to discuss it with the governor. He was busy for five minutes. The Mother, please come in. Will you have a cup of tea? No, no, we don't have anything outside our ashram. Not from the poor, not from the rich. Mother, the LG will be free in a few minutes. What can we do? There is a problem, she said, of the leprosy patients in Delhi. If I can get some land, then they don't have to beg and humiliate themselves. I can look after them. They need not be on the streets of Delhi. I'll set up a hospital. I'll set up dormitories. Let me keep them in dignity. I want land. Mother, how much land are you thinking of? Five acres? About five minutes later, the governor was free. We went in. Mother, will you have a cup of tea? Same answer. What brought you? So then she told him with her full heart about the problems of the leprosy afflicted in India. How they are stigmatized, how they are humiliated. People will reach out to other handicapped people, but people will not reach out to the leprosy affected, even if they may, they may be cured of leprosy. So she spoke very movingly and the governor was also moved and we could all see that he was moved and, uh, and uh, then he asked her, Mother, how much land do you want? Then she looked at me with a smile and she looked at the governor and said, 10 acres. He gave her 11 acres, you know. So I could see then that Mother Teresa was very much, she understood her environment very closely. She could see that everyone was moved. In any case, she was asking nothing for herself. All her life, she only asked for the poor whom she served or maybe something for her sisters. It was never personal. While her internal suffering mounted, her mission among the poor flourished. The expansion was rapid. In the first 25 years of their existence, the missionaries of charity had 704 sisters in 87 foundations, caring for thousands of the poorest of the poor those who found themselves on the margins of society. At the time of her death, there were 3,842 MC sisters in 594 foundations in 120 countries. And look at the way Indians responded to her. She never discriminated. People saw and recognized goodness when she started her first school. Somebody brought a chair, somebody brought a table, somebody brought a blackboard after a few days, some little children, because there were no schools in those days, they sat on the mud in front of her, her little school became a reality. Then she would beg for medicines from the chemist, opened a small dispensary there, little school there, little school there. She learned she could multitask. What an administrator! By the time she dies, she's got a presence in 120 countries. She's got almost 6,000 homes, almost 5,000 sisters. She had so much energy. She didn't need that much sleep. I mean, if you rang her up at 12 at night, she would pick up the phone. And then if you rang her up at 4.30 in the morning, she'd pick up the phone. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I have actually traveled with her to various places. And uh, with the energy that she was moving. I mean, after my husband was also traveling at that time with her, with mother. And uh, I mean, we just gave up after a day and we said, mother, we can't do this all day. So can we just go for an hour and come back and join you? And uh, of course, she said, you do that. And uh, later we asked her, we said, uh, you know, how do you manage? How do you work like this? And she said, I fill my 
tank with prayer. There is hardly any humanitarian award or recognition that has not been conferred upon her. From the Bharat Ratna to the Nobel Peace Prize, she has received them all. I am grateful and I am very happy to receive it in the name of the hungry, of the naked, of the homeless, of the crippled, of the blind, of the lepers, of all those people who feel unwanted, unloved, uncared, throw away of the society. People who have become a burden to the society and are shunned by everybody. In their name, I accept the award. Mother Teresa stated that earthly rewards were important only if they helped her help the world's needy. When she received the Nobel Peace Prize, she was asked, what can we do to promote world peace? She answered, go home and love your family. Her compassion and her dedication and seva that she was doing was so intense that she says he never stops. I said, Mother, aren't you tired? We've spent eight hours doing this, two hours traveling by plane, and now you say you have an appointment. I said, Mother, aren't you, don't you get tired? She said, what can I do? He never stops. So such was the dedication of Mother. Her health was deteriorating. Then from that time, somehow, I wanted to only paint Mother. And uh, then when Mother recovered, slightly, she would come home and, uh, you know, uh, have a five-minute uh, stop on her way to somewhere else. And uh, I would immediately show her what I was doing, painting-wise. And uh, I requested her to sign, because just for memory's sake, and she did. And she uh, you know, I painted her always without details of her face and features. And she'd say, where are my eyes? So <laughs> I said, mother, you know, people will know. I mean, they don't have to see your eyes. They just have to look at you and they are content. On 5th September 1997, a few days after her 87th birthday, Mother Teresa finally went home. Her life was shaped by her commitment to the role of religious tolerance and the place of love and compassion in prayer. Her faith in God was an abiding one and not limited by the confines of Christianity. Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. Hungry not only for bread, hungry for love, for the word of God. I was naked and you clothed me not only with a piece of cloth. Nakedness is that loss of that beautiful human dignity of the child of God. The dignity that have been created to love and to be loved. The day she died, her head ultimately, they were trying all the oxygen, no? I had oxygen cylinder and maze maker, how do you call it, artificial face maker. Electricity went off, but anyhow, I went on holding her head in my hand. I said, God, can we go home? We are in your home. Look at your picture in your room. There. Ah, I forgot. And she kissed her picture three times. I forgot. Then again and again she was going, and she repeated. And her eyes went up three times. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. With her head resting in Sister Gertrude's hands, 
she slowly turned to face the picture of Jesus that hung in her room. Now that she had completed life's journey, one in which she had lived so closely with her Lord, her last words were for Him alone. 